Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 27 of Thick and Thin with LB and Duty. With me, as always, I have the man with the plan, Mr. LB, S-U-T-K-E. LB, say hey, what's up to the crowd? What's up, everybody? And from Canada, from the place that he wishes was America, but unfortunately can never be, <laughs> Mr. Hitman, hit say what's up to everybody. Hey, what's going on, everybody? And for our fourth guest... No one probably knows him, but they will soon, and they will all know this game, because it's, it fa- it's a fantastic game. Uh, Mr. Hugh Jeremy from, well, what's the, we, we all know it's Natural Selection, too. That's the, that's the game. So, what, what's the company? G'day, everyone. Yeah, my name is Hugh, and I'm from Unknown Worlds Entertainment, and we are the developers of Natural Selection, too. Great. And I wanted to have you guys on the show, because I, I, obviously I was at E3, and we, you know, we go to all the big name booths, we do all that kind of stuff. Um, so you didn't see ours then? So <laughs> <laughs> Contraire. We actually did. And that was what really, really impressed me. Um, we went to the booth, we met with you, I met with, I think it's, is it Charlie, uh, one of the lead developers? Yeah, yeah, for sure. You would have, yeah, actually our whole development team, i.e. like all well, seven of us, was there <laughs> at PAX. So it's likely you would have met quite a few of us. And we did. And I have to say, out of all the things you see, you know, there's the one, one thing about going to E3 that is really sort of the gem is finding these, these companies and finding these people that are doing amazing things with video games uh, that for some reason no one ever talks about, probably because you don't have two million, billion, trillion dollars to spend on marketing every 15 seconds. Uh, but yeah. You find games like Natural Selection, and we saw you guys. We loved it, uh, and I had to have you on the show. So, Well, thank you congrats. very much for inviting me. Oh, no problem. Uh, so why don't we take a little bit of time, give, give the audience a little bit of info about what Natural Selection 2 is, and maybe even a little background on uh, what Un- Unknown Worlds is. Sure. So Natural Selection 2 is, funnily enough, the sequel to Natural Selection 1, which was a Half-Life mod uh, released way back in uh, on Halloween 2002, so about 10 years ago. And uh, it's a game that combines shooter and strategy genres in an asymmetrical environment where you have an alien team and a marine team. And uh, Natural Selection 2 is a standalone game, so Natural Selection 1 was a mod, and now we're standalone, we're on, uh, on our own engine. And the Unknown Worlds is the company that was basically founded by the, the bloke who started the Natural Selection phenomenon, Charlie Cleveland, he started Unknown Worlds to be the company that could drive the development of the sequel. So while there have been a a couple of other little projects, Natural Selection 2 is definitely the main project for Unknown Worlds, and it's what drives the whole company. Very cool. And so how did you get started in all this? I mean, are you a gamer, or is it sort of just you got into marketing and you fell in love with this this project? And So how did that kind of happen? Uh, No, I'm definitely uh, not uh, in any way trained in marketing or PR or any of that. Uh, I'm just a bloke who made YouTube videos after hours back home in Australia, and uh, they they took a chance on me, and now here I am in their office amongst some really really cool people, doing some really cool things. Oh, that is that is pretty awesome. So yeah, that's pretty awesome. Gra- grassroots kind of doing your own thing, and then you get hooked up. That's kind of neat. Yeah, that's well, really cool. Actually, I'm definitely not the only one on the team to have been brought in from the community. I mean, where I was making YouTube videos uh, in the community that showed off the game. There were other blokes that were submitting, say, bug fixes or entire features to the game, uh, actual code or art or something like that. And, for example, one of our our most recent hires goes by the name of Matzo, was a community member who was submitting bug fixes and speed improvements and all sorts of cool stuff like that. And now he is on the team. Wow, that's that's pretty. And, And the team's pretty small, right? You said you guys are, is it really just eight guys out there in the office? Actually, well, I can show you right now. Oh, all right. I'm just tipping my camera over right now. Defocusing myself or something, but yeah, basically, you can see our entire office there. Wow, that's it. So, that uh, is awesome. And when I say there are only seven, that's a lie. There are definitely uh, off site people as well. We have a large number of off site people, a mixture of full time, part time, and uh, and contractors that are completely integral to the work of Unknown Worlds. And if you took all those part timers and contractors and off site full timers, you'd probably get to about 16, I think. So you guys have a pretty flexible team then. You can kind of be agile, I guess. Is that is that what sort of is the driving force? You don't need this huge workforce. You just pick and choose as you go, or how does that work? Uh, we'd, we'd probably love to have the resources to have a bigger <laughs> team, given our project is so ambitious. But, I mean, who has all the resources they ever want? And right. you have to you have to play that, the hand you're dealt, and that's, uh, that's what, what Unknown Worlds does. And uh, Charlie and Max... 
and the other senior guys here try to find you know talent wherever they can that are passionate about the game and bring them in and wherever they are in the world and it just so happened I was able to you know get a visa and come here to the US uh, there are other team members out there that are just as integral and that are you know we've got animator in Indonesia our entire mapping team is in the UK wow. we have various people from other areas of the US as well doing some animation stuff so we're all over the place and uh, yeah it's part of being I guess it's part of being a small indie dev that you uh, you know you you roll with what you've got Wow. Well, I, I mean, I guess the big point is with, and we've been talking about this since since I got back from E3, one of the largest things I saw at, it, at E3, and it's kind of carried on since then, uh, obviously the Wii U and a lot of others games are taking on this sort of asymmetric gaming. Um, and it's it's a, it's almost a phenomenon. Uh, we saw a couple games doing it. Obviously, the Wii U was, was the big you know platform that's almost seem, seemingly built on this idea. What? But what is somebody okay? <laughs> yeah, there's there's children's cry, there's children always that's, crying for asymmetrical gaming. Yeah, it's one at, of my at, twins. At LBs, right now, yeah. So. Um, but no, but so we always see this sort of thing now, and it's growing and it's growing. Is this new for you guys? How did how did you sort of come about this asymmetrical type of gaming? And maybe explain for the viewers that don't know what it is, how it's working in your game specifically. I'll have to ask you to define your impression of what asymmetrical gaming is. Are you talking about the fact that we've got a different alien and human team? Well, that's the weird thing. And I think this is sort of this term that's now being thrown around. And I myself don't even know if I get it. Um, <laughs> I mean, and, and really, and I hear it all the time. And I, and I guess the way that Nintendo explains it is you have two separate types of gameplay going on simultaneously. Oh. Um, and I know that yours is kind of that way in the sense that you have RTS happening in one section, but at the same time you're playing an FPS. I mean, is that is that accurate? I guess in in calling it asymmetrical gaming, or how would yeah, you define I mean, it? Yeah, it definitely it's it's an interesting definition that Nintendo has given, and I mean, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that de definition. My kind of remarks would be built around when I think of asymmetry, I traditionally thought of it, uh, and I think we here at Unknown Worlds think of it in terms of having uh, asymmetrical sides in the game. So StarCraft gotcha. would have it, uh, Command & Conquer would have it, uh, to a lesser extent, something like Counter-Strike has it with the different weapons and we have it with aliens and humans. But no, I think what you're onto is really, really interesting. The fact that Nintendo is saying, hey, we're gonna have two different types of gameplay in the one game. And absolutely, I'd say that we are doing that because uh, for those of you watching that, don't, uh, that haven't seen Natural Selection, uh, when you start a game, it's fully multiplayer, there's no single player. Let's say you start a game with six, with 12 people, so six on either side. One of those people will be in a real-time strategy perspective. They'll be playing a game that looks a little bit a little bit like StarCraft or Command and Conquer or something like that. But all the units on the ground are real people playing in the first person. So I think we'd absolutely fit uh, Nintendo's definition there. Uh, I definitely wouldn't say it was a completely new thing. I mean, obviously, Natural Section One did it way right. did it way back in 2002, and before that, you know, Gloom. Uh, there's a lot of other inspirations there. So. Uh, Maybe, though, it's being revived as a phenomenon. I mean, guess with Nintendo's new controller, especially. Elby, you want to take a question here? Well, yeah, I was just, you no. Know, since you brought up the Wii U and, and their controller, with uh, that and also Microsoft Surface application come along, do you see those as two uh, big future either enhancements or directions you might want to take the game? Well... I guess uh, preface answer there firstly by saying we want Natural Selection 2 to be available across as many platforms as possible. That said, we are limited in our resources and we do have to start with the PC and initially stay there. And if we do very well on the PC, it's very possible we could expand outwards to other platforms such as consoles. It tends to be a lot more expensive to develop a game for right. consoles for an indie team. Uh, there's a lot of indie developments that you know started with four people developing a game for the PC and ended up with 12 just to do the port. So it's definitely not wow. a trivial idea. We would like to, and possibly with something like the Wii U, having that secondary screen there could allow some some cool uh, some cool stuff. It's definitely not something we've actively thought about because when we think of going beyond the PC, we think in terms of the baby steps of uh, firstly Mac, possibly Linux, and uh, obviously the, the consoles coming after that, if possible, if the resources are there. So you really got to pay attention to the, I mean, I guess, is that, is that how it is, I guess, for most indies now is you've really got to start with PC. That's got to be where you, where you go just because it's so flexible or. Well, I definitely wouldn't say you have to, it might depend on the game. If, for example, we're building a game that is quite complex. It has graphics that definitely don't look 
uh, like what you might expect from an indie. Uh, you know, we're not doing the cell shaded thing or anything like that, or a simple 3D world. We're doing a world that we want to look AAA in terms of the graphics. And to do that with effectively one bloke, he's pretty much directly opposite from me right now, his name is Max, writing the entire graphics engine from scratch. Uh, you need the flexibility of the PC to be able to do that. With consoles, there's a lot of, there's a lot of walled garden going on, there's a lot of locking down, and it's definitely not a bad place to develop games. Of course, people make a lot of uh, successful games on the console, but for our particular style of project, it wouldn't work. And so one big reason for that is the fact that we develop on a highly, uh, we're very iterative in our development. We move very fast. We like to put out lots of different versions to the public so that they can see them, give feedback, come back to us, we change things, we put it out again. And that's just not possible for a small developer on the console. I mean, there's things like patching fees. We saw that with Fez, that got in the way there. And for us, putting out over 60 builds, I mean, 60 times $40,000 for a patch fee, wow. is just funding that, I mean, we could dream of having. <laughs> right, but it's not, not feasible. It's, and, yeah, it's not feasible. And so what made you, I guess, because I know you guys, you said you started off as a Half-Life mod, is that correct? Yes, absolutely correct. What, what made you then, I guess, is it almost a leap of faith to say, hey, we just want to do our own engine. Cause that you don't hear. That's one thing I would say <laughs> when I think of an indie, I don't think, Hey, indies build their own engine. That's almost always something that they license or, you know, they, a lot of people like to use different, you know, they pick a different uh, package that they use, but what mm -hmm. made you say, screw it. We're doing our own engine. Wh where did that come from? It's a complicated question with a complicated answer. And it definitely wasn't just uh, doing things the hard way for the sake of doing things the hard way. There are a lot of reasons we decided to go with our own engine uh, one of the primary ones is that while Source is a fantastic engine, and obviously so many great games come out for it, when Max and Charlie were first starting out with Unknown Worlds and starting to try and put Natural Selection 2 into the Source engine, they started changing the Source engine in ways that it wasn't entirely comfortable being changed. And when you start to get inside an engine, really mess with its guts, tinker around, start changing bolts, you can have unintended cascading effects within that engine that can cause instability, performance problems, all sorts of crazy stuff that you just do not want to deal with. And so that was one of the reasons. Another reason is with a very small team, I mentioned this earlier, we want to be very iterative. We want to be right. able to put a version out very quickly, change it very quickly using uh, minimal programmer hours to do it, bring it back in, change it again. Now with Spark, the entire game code is open source and written in a scripting language called Lua. What that means is one programmer can do a lot of scripting, a lot of coding in a very short amount of time relative to if the, uh, the engine was using game code written in a less, a less, a less, uh, a less scripted language. Right. So those are a couple of, and I could r prattle on for those advan about those advantages, but suffice to say, there are a lot of reasons <laughs> and those are just touching the surface and it definitely wasn't just a, hey, let's go make our own engine because that'll make us cool. Right. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, that's still really cool. I mean, regardless of what your reasoning is, it's just something you do not hear every day. So when, when I heard that, I mean, and I heard it at E3, you know, he, and he was very excited about it. Charlie was very, you know, animated about, we built our own engine, you know, um, <laughs> mostly because I think it, and what you touched on before, it looks triple A. Uh, if I was to see this Thank and you. yeah. And when we looked at, when we looked at the trailer, I, I kept you know, talking over to my friend, I was like, this is, you know, better than a lot of the Call of Duties I've seen and a lot of, I mean, the, the level of detail that you've been able to generate from this engine is nothing short of remarkable. Um, Thank you. And we haven't even finished adding that's, the graphical options. So I mean, that's <laughs> absolutely crazy. Like, uh, ambient occlusion, color correction going in that we hope to get in for release, uh, maybe, maybe just after release, but there's definitely a lot to come in terms of graphics. So. And now you said the community was a big part um, of kind of getting you to where you are now. And you were technically even a part of that community as well. Oh, yeah. Are you, are you keeping that feel? I mean, obviously, I would think you'd have to. And you even talked about the scripting language. Is it going to be then so where if someone wants to write a mod for your engine, uh, they're able to sort of tack on their own thing to natural selection? Or is that are you kind of leaving that uh, on the outs for now? Well, uh, this gives me an opportunity to prattle on a little bit more about Spark <laughs> and why we chose to create Spark. Natural Selection 1 was a mod. It came from modding. The whole concept of Natural Selection wouldn't have been possible without modding and the fact that Half-Life and then Source allowed so much modding, uh, given we were on the Half-Life, uh, the gold Source engine, back with Natural Selection 1. We wanted to continue that into Natural Selection 2. Now, if you are yourself a Source game, you don't have control over how moddable 
you can make source. That's Valve's decision. Because Spark is our engine, we can make the decision about how moddable we want it to be. And we right. might have gone a little bit nuts <laughs> in terms of moddability. You might have heard me mention that the game, so the game code is open source. That is true. Not only can you just go into the Natural Selection 2 directory and open up the game's source code with Notepad, because it's just there, it's completely unprotected, it's there for you, you can also open it up with Decoder, which is the actual scripting tool that we wrote and we include with the game. And also we include the map editor, we include animation tools, we include all sorts of stuff with the game, with any purchase of the game or any pre-order access or whatever, however you've got access to NS2, you've got these tools. So the game is so incredibly moddable that, I mean, pieces of the game have already been created by modders. We have maps in the game now that were created by modders and are now officially part of the game. The Map Summit was created by a community member called Psycho Man. It's now officially part of the game. It will ship with the game. Wow. We've had lighting tools, sound tools written by the community. We've had a spectator mode written by the community. It's called Insight. It's now officially in the game. So when we say we are tight with our community, we really, truly mean it, and we have evidence to back that up. Wow. I mean, that, I mean, that's fantastic. It's it's that level of support, I think, and, and especially in community, I think we've seen a trend. Um, I mean, even in Battlefield, uh, you know, when they when they first wrote that, that was a huge community game. Uh, 1942 was really popular. Everyone put mods for it. And we've seen this trend where as the games get better and sort of more AAA, if you will, uh, it gets locked down more and more. And it's really rare to find a game where you actually have a community that's embraced uh, and they're actually helping the game, I think, become better. Uh, and I think it's really rare nowadays. I think it's, I don't know why that's gone away. I don't know what the reasoning is behind that, but it's nice to see that at least in natural selection, that's going to be something you're steering away from. Um, hit, Certainly are. <laughs> hit, you were, you were talking about it before, but uh, I know you got some questions that you wanted to ask uh, specifically about asymmetrical gaming and, and kind of where it came from. You want to well, ask a couple well of before we I ask another question, I'm kind of curious. Um, is Unknown Worlds worried that um, the community can make their own version of another game, kind of like how they did Natural Selection? Is there any, like, copyright or anything, any worries like that where someone might just make a brand new game out of your own game? Well, we hope they will. We absolutely hope they will. That's, uh, that's exactly why... We, I mean, that's well, it's part of the reason why, it's an important reason why we give away the game source code and we give away all the tools we use to make it and we make the engine so open. It's so that anyone can create anything they want. If you have a dream, if you have a natural selection dream in your head right now and you're looking for an engine that will allow you to go nuts and make it very easily, then we would hope that our, tool, our tools and our engine allows people to do that. And who knows, there could be someone out there that creates a game for the Spark engine using a, a copy of Natural Selection 2 that they've bought and creates another Dota or another Counter-Strike or another Natural Selection or all these amazing games that are now part and parcel of the gaming landscape came from mods and we absolutely want to encourage that. We would love it if someone went out there and made a new game using, using the Spark engine. It would be, it would be brilliant. So, so that really remains open source for you. You have no plans of sort of maybe licensing that out. I mean, that's really you want to oh. see those games. Okay, yeah, that's a, that's uh, that's different. It gets a little more complicated there. So, if someone was to just make a mod, say a total conversion mod, an entirely new game on Spark, and not sell it, then that's they can absolutely go and do that to their absolute heart's content. If someone wanted to sell a game uh, using Spark, so if you wanted to create a game, charge people five dollars. Uh, and you use the Spark engine to do it, then you, you would have to come and talk to us. Okay. Uh, that's <laughs> the way the world works. And it. it's important that people can't just, you know, go and completely profit like that off, right. off work like that. But of course, you know, if someone came to us and said, hey, we've got this new game, it's called, I don't know, I don't know, come up with a funny name for me. And, and we would like to sell Laser ponies. $3 on Steam. Yes. Of course, we're not going to say, oh, you can't do that. That's copyright, blah, blah, blah. And we would have a productive conversation with those people, and we would absolutely want that game to be out there. So, uh, yeah. But, of course, if you're not charging for it, you can, you can do whatever the hell you want, like Dota, like Counter-Strike, right. and like the original natural selection. Gotcha. So, uh, LB, I guess you take the question. What, what do you think about this, you know, in terms of past, present, and future, LB? I know you were asking that earlier, um, that you were asking a question at least about how come we've seen this in the, in the, in the past, but it didn't, uh, I can't remember your saying, but it didn't sort of take on, but now it has. 
I'm trying to think of what you're referring well, to. Well, <laughs> let me do it for you. Let me help you out, brother. Let me help you out, bro. I got your back. Uh, basically, what we were we were talking about this earlier before the show of how we've seen these things. We've seen asymmetrical gaming. It's been something that's we that's been going on for for years. Um, we've seen it in and and really, I guess Nintendo and even the Dreamcast. You know, with the, with the sort of v, I think they called the VU oh, yeah. back then. Yeah. That sort of idea has been there. Why is it sort of taken so long? Is it maybe a technology thing that's got you guys to this level? I know that I know that at least for you, this you know this was something you did in two thousand one. You said, um, but as an idea, at least we've seen this sort of separate gameplay thing happening all out all throughout E three, and it's sort of emerging as being one of the new styles of gameplay. Why, why is it taking this long? I guess for for people to to catch on, and do you sort of see this type of gameplay? as the new level of gaming? Is this, is, is this the next genre, mixing the genre, so to speak? Well, ugh, I'd probably come at that from two sides. The first is when you're doing a hardware thing like the Wii U was doing or like the Dreamcast did, obviously you've got to have that hardware. And if that hardware is part of an ecosystem of other hardware, say maybe you've got the Wii U up against the Xbox 720 or something, right. if the Xbox 720 doesn't have similar function functionality, then when Call of Duty or whatever is made for and put out, it's not going to be built specifically to take advantage of the Wii U's hardware and all that. So I don't know. Maybe that's why these pieces of hardware haven't been terrifically successful in the past. Maybe they will be. But within the software space specifically, so like a game like the original Natural Selection in 2002, uh, Nuclear Dawn also did right. it. They had a real-time strategy perspective as well, so it's definitely being done. Why hasn't this genre mixing taken off as much? Well, I would venture, and this is very much a personal opinion, that it is a hard concept to execute. It is very difficult yeah. to combine real-time strategy and first-person shooting into a cohesive package and have people have a really enjoyable experience. We'd like to think we did it with natural selection, although there's, I mean, despite its immense popularity, it did equal the original Team Fortress in play-in numbers. It was not a game that was accessible to the entire PC gaming space. It was right. a complex game. And uh, with, the, with the sequel, we're addressing that a bit. You know, we don't want it to be an opaque... Uh, an opaque game that people can't get into and combining the genres, making that uh, that asymmetrical link between real-time strategy and first-person shooter is difficult. But what I always say to people when they say, hey, that's that's hard, that's hard. Well, some of the greatest things that get done anywhere, anywhere in our countries or in civilization or whatever, are really hard. What did America do just two days ago? They landed a robot on Mars using a bloody hovering space, but that was really <laughs> difficult. And when people said to NASA, hey guys, that looks really hard, do you think NASA thought, oh yeah, it's hard, it's probably a bad idea? No, they knew that it was a good idea. And they convinced people by doing it and making it work and showing people this is actually a really cost-effective way to land 900 kilograms of robot on another <laughs> planet. So just because something's hard doesn't mean it's bad. And when it comes to combining real-time strategy and first-person shooter, yes, is a hard thing to do, but we're confident that when you play Natural Selection 2, you will you'll think, well, actually, you know what? Because this was harder, it is a much more rewarding gaming experience. I can have a leadership experience with other human beings here that I have never encountered in any other game ever. And that's what we hope. And I would venture that the reason we don't see a lot of these games is that it is a hard concept to execute. And that's and that's a good point. First of all, liking yourself to NASA, you already win, right? I mean, that's <laughs> smooth move there. Well, you got to do it, right? No, you got to do it. I mean, right, really, right, Natural right. Selection to NASA, pretty much the same thing in my book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, they're they're basically the yeah, same yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. but no, but I mean, it is a good thing. And uh, I guess the the, the follow up, then I think everything seems to lead into into esports. Is that something you're you're kind of looking into? Is taking it sort of in that esports thing? Because everyone that builds a game now. It's got to be eSports. You know, it's like, that's the yeah, thing. The Can we see it on the circuit? Are people going to play it? Where are the pros? And who is sponsoring them? I mean, that is like, that's always the next question. Is that something in the back of you guys' mind? Is that how you want it to, to play out? I would hug you through this camera if I could. <laughs> I love it when people ask that question. It's just this amazing opportunity for me to go nuts into the microphone. The answer is yes. Right. Why? Well, let's pick out a piece of your question. There was a particularly telling part of your question where you said, Will we see it on the circuit? Now, that's a, that's a part of the question a lot of people ask. If this is going to be a successful eSport game, will we see it on the circuit? Now, what is the circuit? If the circuit is defined by, say, MLG, right. then I think it's highly unlikely you'll see Natural Selection 2 on MLG. We don't have the resources to get up there the way that circuit works. If, however, the circuit is 
Is this game being played competitively on a regular basis with a fantastic spectator experience live? Are there tournaments? Is it going to events and having prize pools? Right. You will absolutely see Natural Selection 2 there. And why can I say that with such conviction? Because it already has and it already is and it will continue to do so. If you go on YouTube and search for NS2HD or Natural Selection 2 Competitive or even on YouTube.com slash Unknown Worlds, we have a very recent game up there, you will see competitive Natural Selection 2 play. It is being played with a spectator view. We're building that into the game. I mentioned that it was community oh, cool. built. So esports, it's already happening for us. We are not asking permission from the gaming world to allow NS2 to be an esport. We're already doing it. We're very serious about it and we'll continue to be very serious about it and support our community in building Natural Section 2 into an esport. Now, what do you think about that, Hit? I know you, Hit's kind of our resident uh, MLG guy. Um, <laughs> do you have any questions for him, Hit, in terms of MLG? Because I know that's a big deal to even our community. So, I mean, is there anything that you kind of see that needs to be asked? Well, you just mentioned uh, spectator mode. Do you, as a developer, think that if a game wants to head towards the esports route, that they have to have a spectator mode? Is that like a key element to have in order to be an esport title? Well, do you watch StarCraft at all? Yes. Do you watch more StarCraft than you play? Yes. I think that your answer would be similar to most people's answers. It's certainly true for me, for almost everyone else in this office that's into StarCraft. Yes, we think a spectator mode is absolutely essential. We think some of the best esport games out there are incredible viewer experiences. It's not just about the players. Of course, it must be about the players. They must be having an amazing time. It must be a very deep game. But it is so crucial if you want to be an esport for the game to allow people to view what's going on. It's just it's non-negotiable because if right. you want to be up in lights, if you want to be on MLG or or, or, a, or a smaller platform, people need to be able to come. They need to be able to get excited. Why is the 100 meter sprint uh, an, an amazing sport to an amazing sport because people love watching Usain Bolt crushing everything that comes before him. And it's if you true. want to be an eSport, we think it is absolutely the same thing. And that is why we're so serious. Our community has built an amazing spectator mod called Insight. And it is now being included officially in the game as part of the game. And we'll continue to, to, to grow on that. We won't have a replay system for version one. Okay. We will absolutely have a spectator system. We will have, uh, hopefully, a replay system further down the track. Wow. I mean, the, go, ahead, go ahead. Does it baffle you that when a game comes out that doesn't have a spectator mode. Now, the reason why I ask this is because uh, Halo or uh, Battlefield 3 in particular, they don't have spectator modes and they're highly um, uh, thought of as esports titles. Does it baffle you when I when a game like that comes out, it doesn't have it? Because in my point of view, it baffles me. Like, I totally agree with you. You, you mm. have to have a spectator mode in your game if you want to be uh, legitimately considered an esports title. Does it baffle? What do you think when companies like that don't include it? It's, it doesn't baffle me that they don't include it. It perhaps baffles me, baffles me a little bit that a large proportion of the game gaming community assumes that they will be esports. I think a title like Battlefield 3, I mean, it's a brilliant title. I've racked up so many hours in that game. I don't think it was designed to be an esports title and maybe that wasn't where their priorities were and that's perfectly okay because they produced a really, really good game. And for us, we have perhaps a, a different set of priorities. Maybe, you know, instead of putting out Battlefield 3 and then Battlefield 4 and Battlefield 5, etc., maybe we're putting out Natural Section 2 and then we're just going to keep supporting that into right. the, the very, very far future. And because of those differing priorities, and I'm not saying one is better than the other, it's just a fact that there are differing priorities, it could be the case that a lot of these games don't really see themselves as having a long-term future as an eSport. I mean, some of the biggest eSports, StarCraft 1, right. has been around forever. And so these, these are very high-tempo turnover games. Right. We won't see Battlefield 3 being played as much in two years as it is now, even though we will see StarCraft 2 being played as much. So... There's differing priorities, and we would like Natural Section 2 to be a game that is supported by its community and us for a very, very long time. And that allows it to then hopefully be an eSport and hopefully get on some medium-sized circuits and who knows, maybe even bigger. <laughs> so I, I know you got a ton of, that you don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to say... Oh, no, it's totally cool. Totally cool. Keep firing questions. The harder they are, it's the better. <laughs> I got to say, 
you're actually really great. We talked to several devs. We talked to several PR people as well, and they're usually really guarded about about their games. And I always wonder why. Yeah. You you yeah. you've got a game. Uh, people want to an know explanation it. Explanation for that. Is, is there? <laughs> I, I, maybe that is a good question then. Why the big thing about Natural uh, Selection Two? And I must say, you guys were really open at E3. We talked about almost anything. In fact, I almost had to say, Charlie, I gotta go. He was so. You probably have to do that. With he me. was yeah. so animate about the game, and he truly loved it. That I was a Natural Selection two believer. I walked in having no idea. The next time, next time I'm walking out, I'm like, Why don't I own this game right now? I had this crazy desire to go out and get it right away. What is it about your company? What is it about even maybe you that makes you guys so unguarded and so I almost would say forceful about why we should all go out and grab Natural Selection two? What is it? It's oh, see, I would say it's almost refreshing too. It, oh, it is refreshing. You know what, I mean? uh, what kind of I'm Kool-Aid blessed, are they are they giving blessed, you over there? I guess is my well, next question. Okay, uh, first off, just to bring you viewers in on the loop, I said at the start of this uh, this cast to to our, our kind presenters, oh guys, how long do you think this will go for? And they said, oh, an hour. And I thought, oh no, not an hour. I won't be able to talk for an hour. I'll, I'll run out of things to say. But luckily, uh, our, our kind presenters are very good at asking very cool questions, and I'm sure I could ramble on forever. <laughs> That's a warning. You'll have to cut me off now. What is in the water? Yes, uh, what is in the water? <laughs> You know what? I think it's uh, it's the bloke sitting on the other side of this room because uh, until five months ago, I was a Lord Imperial fanboy. I would go home every night and make YouTube videos after dark, uh, and that was what I did uh, every night after my job. And there are people in the community that do the equivalent of that now in different ways. Maybe they create art, maybe they play test. There is something about the energy and the devotion that the founders of this little enterprise have brought to their game and their conviction in that it can be a great game experience, that is infectious. And it's their enthusiasm that infected me. And I like to still think of myself as a fanboy. And it can get a bit embarrassing with press because they'll ask me what I do. And I always stay away from the word PR guy. And they sometimes try to skewer me on that and say, well, why don't you just say you're the PR guy? Well, there's nothing wrong with being a PR guy, but I don't think I am one. And I don't think this game needs one because I'm a fanboy and I am not faking it. And I think that a lot of people that go out and promote the game and chief among them, you met Charlie yes. at E3, uh, that he's not faking it either. And oh, there's no, no reason to fake it. it. And I think that's why we you know, can put uh, our lead program, our technical artist, technical director, art director in front of the press and have no worries about what they or anyone else says because there's nothing to hide. It's completely natural. We are just generally, genuinely, enthusiastic <laughs> that's that's i guess that's what it is yeah i mean it's 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 really quite amazing and i think even when i sat there, i met you I, I for maybe five ten minutes on the way out but like you said i mean you don't see developers that will sit and talk with you he wasn't even just talking to me about natural selection he was talking to me about gaming <laughs> What he thought, you know, what, and that's really what we like to do even on this show. Uh, one of the things we hate is if we get a, a PR guy, like you say, to come on the show, we want to talk about not just your game, but how you got to your point as a gaming company. What made you passionate? Why did you build your game? These are things at least I want to know. The viewers, maybe not. I don't know. But it's one of the things that I <laughs> love to know. And it's my show, damn it, and I'll ask the questions. But well, you're, very, you're very welcome to ask me. <laughs> Charlie's passion, where he got the seed and the idea for natural selection, was that he looked at he looked at battle as in essence what is battle and war. And a lot of games are built around the idea of war. It makes a good setting for games as horrible as it is and as terrible as it is in real life. And there was this this key disconnect he found in games that he was playing. You know, a lot of great games he was loving. You know, Starcraft. There's a bit of gloom in there. There's a whole bunch of other. You know. Uh, inspirations. Uh, Aliens is a huge inspiration. It's actually just sitting right there behind me on that bookshelf and he said, what's missing here? Well, when you go into battle, there are leaders and there are, there are, there are soldiers. And that is a crucial thing that is true of any battle. But in most games, we only have one of those sides. And probably the reason you don't get it in games, and I'm rambling here, so you can feel free to cut me off, <laughs> is that it's, a, it's difficult because leadership requires it requires a bit of skill. It requires a bit of leadership, and that's not, and we know in society as a whole, from business to the actual military to to academia, that it's really hard to find leaders, and so it is hard. But why, if gaming is touching so many other facets of society, why are we not touching leadership? And I, I know that when Charlie came up with the natural section two, that was a big part of it. He wanted there to be that 
that commander soldier interconnect and that's i mean it's certainly what drew me to it i love the idea of a game that, that goes into leadership so that's probably i mean you were wondering the gaming background that's that's right that's a big chunk of it there LB, you now, Hugh, we've there? got a uh, well. I've got two questions. The first one is from our our live audience right now, and Slice Breadman wants to know what is your main focus for release. Cool. Uh, that's have you asked that a better time, Slice Breadman, or what? There's actually there's a. I'll do this again. There's a glass table behind me. Uh, we sometimes play ping pong on it, but on that <laughs> table, and I don't know if you're going to try and like freeze frame that and digitally enhance, but has our projected release date and all the things we want to do before release date on it. Uh, and a lot of it is, all right, we've got so many cool ideas for this game. We want just things to be able to come out of walls and we want camera views from the rifles and we want to be able to have uh, gender selection on the soldiers and we want to have all this amazing cool stuff. We want to have matchmaking and all that. But whoa, whoa, chill out. That <laughs> Release date, it's coming up really fast. And so right now our focus is on stopping, calming down, and just getting the game into a, a polished, cohesive whole that will stand on its own and that will allow us to come into the market, make hopefully a bit of a splash, and then from there, continue to develop. Right. Because when Natural Section 2 is released, it's not the, it's not the end, it's the beginning. It's not even the midpoint, we hope, you know, even after even after four or five years of development, we hope it's the beginning of, of adding more stuff to this game. You know, all those things I mentioned and more. So what are we focusing on? Getting it into a cohesive hole that's ready to stand on its own and be a platform upon which we can build for a long time. And uh, if you're wanting to know specifics, well, it's performance and usability and getting the very, very final unity in the EXO and uh, also some maps as well. So those are the three big big folks is performance first usability and getting the final units in so you kind of got to like you said at some point you've really got to just get it out there i mean you can you could do this forever you could develop for years yeah uh, and are absolutely you, are you close to that point as, as a follow-up uh, it's difficult objectively yes subjectively and emotionally for us here in the office no no we're nowhere near what we want you know the game to be in the end but where is the end well, it comes back to the fact that we're not going to be stopping development on this game once we release it. It's going to continue for, for hopefully a very long time, you know, depending on whether sales can keep this company going. So do we think that we're going to release on launch day and be completely satisfied? No way. We will launch on release day and we'll be playing in the pub servers and watching videos and reading reviews and going, right, let's get into the office tomorrow and make this better, get it running faster, get it running more, make it more usable, make right. more units, make the balance better. So. I mean, we're definitely going to be very, very happy with the product we put out, but we want it to be ever better. There's never going to be a limit, and it's not, it's not going to be good enough in our, in our hearts on launch day. Right. Hey, you got, you got some other questions for him? We're going to do a couple more viewer questions, and then and we'll let you get out of here. Um, Performance-wise, what kind of PC do you see um, a user having to play your game? Can anyone play it? Um, well, that's, that's a really good question. PC? Yeah, so uh, we don't want this game to be the kind of game that's only playable on something like this. Uh, you know, <laughs> piece, Dear Lord, it? what is that? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that wasn't a computer. That, yeah, so that's the kind of PC we, we don't want people to have to have to play this game. And we know there's a lot, there's been some games out there that have released and have suffered because their performance requirements have been too high. You've needed a GDX 590 and an i7 right. 3930K, you know. That said, we are not completely comfortable with where our performance is right now. Now, we do have some absolute specs to give you. I'm not going to dance around this question and waffle <laughs> until you've forgotten or start wanting to kill me. Over in the corner over there, there's just your average standard uh, Dell PC. And I don't know if you guys can see this in the zoom. Right on this because I want to prove what I'm saying. <laughs> It's, really, it's, it's just it's a box really with important. nothing in it. There's nothing in it. <laughs> I just want to prove that I'm not pulling this out of my butt. So over there is a computer sitting on the ground, and it really exists. And that is Max's desk, and he's very happy that I was not looking at him just then. He was actually <laughs> out of his chair. But that PC has in it an old Core 2 Duo E8 400 and a NVIDIA 8800 GT. So that hardware is getting pretty old, objectively. Right. Now, that's the PC. Our lead, our, our commander and lord of programming plays on every day. Now, we are committed to making the game absolutely playable on his PC. 
Now, playable does not mean 30 FPS. It means bouncing around above that. Right. So you're not dipping down below that. You know, you will occasionally, but uh, not too often. So that's what we're committed to. So, for example, the PC I used to record all my NS2 HD videos on when I was still just a fanboy and not a fanboy with his dream job was a NVIDIA GTS 450 and a, uh, a Phenom 2 X6 1090T. So it was, it was cool hardware. I loved it. I saved up forever to build it, but it's definitely not, you know, multi-thousand dollar re right. potential. And our minimum specs will actually be a Core 2 Duo at 2.6 oh, wow. plus an really? 8600. 8, we're hoping for an 8600 GT. We're actually more CPU bound than oh, no kidding. GPU bound. Now, uh, sorry, you got, can you guys still hear me? Am I... Oh, yeah, I got you. Oh, yeah, oh, cool. yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. yeah, we so, got you. I am. I'm coming to the. I'm coming to the conclusion with this because I want to <laughs> be quite in depth here because it's a really important question. And I really want to answer it very right. thoroughly for your viewers. Now we know that the game runs well on Max's PC, and it has those specs. And I could. I mean, if he wasn't using it and he didn't depend on it, I would go go over, rip it open, and show you that box right now. What we don't know is how the game will react, and our brand new engine will react in specific hardware environments that might say have a different motherboard. Right have a different amount of RAM or something. Maybe there's something different in the operating system. Maybe you run something a little bit differently to the way Matt's does. Now, for a very tiny team, we cannot guarantee that all the time. We're trying our damn hardest, yeah. and believe me, we talk about it every day. But that is our minimum spec that we're aiming for, for a playable experience at 1280 by 720. And we're confident that we will hit it, and we will then, from there, continue to try and make the game better and better. And obviously, there's server performance and all that stuff I could go into, but. I'm sure I'd bore you guys to death if I kept going on that for any longer. No, I got to say, everyone, I mean, no. I, chat loves you because they, 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 they think, how could someone <laughs> be this energetic and not Come just here, pass out? At some point, you're just going to pass out. It's fantastic. <laughs> no, I mean, honestly, I love it. I, you, you, you just, like I said, you don't get this type of, of discussion with pretty much any other dev team. I mean, it just, it just, it's so rare. So it's nice to see that. I mean, it really is. And if you guys can hit those specs, it's quite impressive. I mean, that is, that's pretty impressive. Um, yeah, and it well, seems to be yeah, the thing now, true. like hitting the low specs is tough. Uh, hitting the, the higher specs seems to be not, not so hard because you've got to, I mean, obviously you want to be future forward, as they say. Well, and a lot of it is, you know, a lot of these games that come out today are written for the Xbox and the PlayStation 3, which are just objectively very weak hardware these days. And, you know, PC hardware for a hundred bucks, you know, a hundred dollar graphics card is going to blow the graphics power of those platforms out of the water. So it's very easy, you know, if you've spent all that time optimizing for the Xbox and PS3 and then you let right. that baby loose on the, you know, crazy hardware, then absolutely the game is going to bloody well fly. So, right. you know, you can crank it. For us, tiny team going for the PC, you know, wading into the waters that are all these different hardware configurations, it's all good and well for us to say, hey, Max's computer is old and he programs on it every day and he plays on it every day, but we know that game doesn't quite act like that on every PC, but we're working so hard to make sure it does. Very cool. LB, you want to take a Cotter, Cotter's question? Because I think it's actually a pretty kind of it moves to this, I guess, but what we've just been yeah, talking about. Yeah, no problem. Uh, our buddy Jay Cotter wants to ask, as a dev, do you see gaming shifting back to the PC in the future? Um, That's a pretty good question. I think it looks like this. I think it looks like a wave. And right now, the, the experiences you can have on PC right now, in this year, 2012, with very reasonably priced hardware, simply can blow the consoles out of the water. And when the next console generation arrives, I think that'll change. It always does. When they were released, the Xbox 360 and the PS3 created a platform upon which great-looking games could be built at a price point that, uh, that equaled or, or went below the equivalent PC and allowed a much wider uh, a market to come in and experience, you know, really great graphics and all that. Now, now obviously, where we are with technology having advanced so fast in the intervening six years or seven years or however long it's been since those consoles came along, has allowed a much cheaper PC to produce a much greater experience. And, right. and until those next consoles arrive, I think the wave will keep going up for the PC. And then when they do arrive, naturally it will come down. But PC gaming will never die. And right. hopefully, you know, this opportunity the consoles are giving us uh, at this time in the world when gaming is just being embraced by so many more people and with Intel releasing ever better integrated graphics, which is supremely important to the penetration of PC games in, in the, the less hardcore market. Absolutely, I think the PC is just going to keep going up and the consoles will dent that a little and, and that's natural and it's competition and it's great. And yeah, I think it's a really positive outlook for the PC. Nice. Now, 
I kind of have a question on the actual gameplay itself. I, I haven't, I didn't get a chance to play an actual selection one, or you know, I've seen some videos and stuff. But can you explain exactly the process of? I guess you have your, your first person shooter, and then you have like a commander, or, or how does that work, or either on both sides, or? Sure, sure. Uh, oh, yeah, my, I'm urging, I'm itching to just like start the game <laughs> right, right here next to me. I don't know. We'll see how long it takes. <laughs> load, we'll see. Um, right, so every game has two commanders, one on the alien side and one on the marine side. Uh, anyone can be that commander and anyone can get in and out at any time. And wow, this is actually loading pretty fast, so I might actually be able to show you this. Uh, at any time. It's completely fluid, and when this loads, I will actually show you guys live on the stream. Let's hope our internal build plays ball with me. <laughs> so we don't have any... I'll tell you guys a funny story while it loads. I went on stage at DreamHack to present the game. And there's two stages of DreamHack we were presenting on. One was the main stage, one was a little, well, not a little, but a lecture hall. Now, on the main stage, I alt-tabbed into a developer build of the game live on stage. Worked fine. Flawlessly, the game came out. Brilliant. Did the same thing live in the, in the lecture hall. Bam! The thing crashed on us right there. So <laughs> oh, God, if you're a developer out there, just think twice. It's, uh, it's definitely, definitely not advisable. Now, I really want to show you this. So, can you guys see that? No. No. Okay. How yeah. about now? Yes, you can. Yeah, I just bit, want yeah. to show you no, just how can. seamless it is to get in and out of the real-time strategy perspective. So here I go. I'm joining the Marine side. I won't go into too much detail. I know you've got limited time and you want to keep me off. All right, I've started. This is what I see at the start of the game as a human soldier. There's this building over here. It looks kind of special. It's the command station. Now, I can run up to that game, and actually, I'm going to have to turn cheats on because there's no one else in this server with me. Cheater. So excuse me on that. Okay, so the game's actually started now. We've activated cheats. Now, I'm going to run up to this command station structure. Press E, and uh, voila, I'm in real-time strategy view. Oh, very cool. Now, if I was to say drop a structure down there, I'm going to drop an armory, just like you would in any other RTS. We've got a right side of the screen contextual menu, minimap on the left, all that good stuff. I'm going to log back out, and now you can see there it is. Now, of course, when you've got actually people playing with you, you're not a loner like me, you'll have people in the game that will be doing that with you and you won't actually have to get in and out of the command station. I'm just demonstrating that it is completely seamless and fluid and it's like that for both sides of the game. And uh, I mean, that's what, when, we, when I say real-time strategy cross first-person shooter, we really, really do mean it. It is there and it is fluid. Wow, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's pretty, pretty awesome. That is pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. A, a question, I guess, on, on top of that, since you brought up you know, everyone else playing the game, uh, and we'll, we'll try to make this our last one, uh, Wham from our from our chat is actually asking: With the game being so moddable, uh, is there any plan to keep average Joes in a full world of tech savvy players and dominators and people that you know they're just nerdcore, let's say, about a game? <laughs> uh, what is there for the average guy that just wants to pick up and play? I know you said it's a, it's a hard game and it's difficult to master. Does that mean that if, if I just pick it up tomorrow and I verse you, am I going to get some kills? Am I going to do anything? Or am I just going to be sitting there looking at the, the respawn screen like so often in my life? Well, uh, you are going to have to learn to fight. I mean, if right. you were to pick up Battlefield or Call of Duty today, you'd have to learn how, to, how the mechanics of those games work. You'd have to, I mean, obviously, you know, you've got the aim down sight, move around, shoot, okay. But you'll have to learn the quirks of those games, and it's the same with Natural Selection 2. You could absolutely pick it up and be running around as a human soldier like that, and and absolutely you could kill an alien the first time you dive in. I mean, I know we had uh, we had Total Biscuit here in the office uh, a little while ago, and he played as a as a marine, and uh, he got a kill straight away because it was sort of natural. He was playing in that first person perspective. That said, you have to work out the fact that these guys are running all over the walls. If you are playing on the alien side, you have to learn to run all over the walls or, or blink or fly or whatever your particular alien does. So while you do have to learn the basics of the combat mechanics, that, I think that's true for any game. And yeah. our, our mechanics definitely have a bit of depth to them. You know, Not every game lets you run on the walls and bite and, and switch to a parasite. And there's a lot of depth there. But I think you could absolutely pick it up. And uh, uh, one of the big things is, I mean, we said it's hard, but we're working really hard on usability. Right. So little hints throughout the game that don't uh, don't annoy players, especially you know the experienced players, and they can turn them off. But that gently guide and help new players learn some of the more advanced things. Like there's a commander up there. This extractor needs to be built to collect more resources so you can buy shotguns. Things like that. Things that take time. But again, I come back to the fact that just because something's hard doesn't mean it's bad. It might mean it is more rewarding. And undoubtedly, a player is going to have to be more patient with Natural Selection 2 than Modern Warfare 3. There right. is going to be more depth there. But we would hope, and it is only the players that are going to be able to judge of this, no matter what I say, 
we would hope that they would find that that depth is more rewarding and that they do enjoy it and then they are willing to spend an extra 10, 15 minutes figuring things out before they feel comfortable to get a more rewarding gameplay experience. So are you going to have sort of those, you know, I guess follow up, uh, are you going to have some of, some of those tool tips and help like hand holding, I guess is what they call it in video games. Uh, but, you know, are you going to have some of those things maybe along the way to, little, to, to push them forward and say, oh, oh, I didn't know I could do this. Now I know. Or is it oh, sort of that sure. discovery yeah. process? Oh, so you I are going to sort of one that. of them had popped up on the screen, but they haven't. Oh, that's of course because it, it it tracks how much you played. So oh, if okay. you played a lot, it stops activating them as much. But absolutely. So little things like uh, well, I mean, here's a very simple one. I don't know if you guys can still see this very well. I won't move the camera for you, but when I run up to the armory and press, it, it tells me I need to press E. Right. So little okay. things like that. And yes. that sounds simple, but there's a lot of things like that. Bring up your map with C. Very important to be able to see where you are in the world. All of those kinds of little things. Uh, banners that say, hey, your hive is under attack, you know, to help you get back there. Right. Waypoints, auto waypoints. And of course, the commander is above you and can direct you as well to help you out. So there's definitely a lot of, we're trying to put a lot of grease on the ground so people right. can slide in and, and have a lot of fun and, and get into the game. Right. Well, I mean, fantastic. And again, thanks for coming. You know, you said you only had to do a, a, a half hour. It's been 50 minutes. Just letting you know. Oh, well, we, mate, we've got another we've 10 minutes. It. And if you want to run it out, <laughs> I'm totally cool with that. But I know you guys wanted to do some some other unrelated NS2 stuff. So I'm happy to bail out if you want me to. Oh, no, no. It's totally. I mean, we, we we're just glad to have you on. Honestly, it was it was fantastic. If anyone in, in chat has so any much. last questions before we go, because we're going to probably cut the stream after this. If you got any questions, ask him now. Obviously, Hugh will answer them in full length. There will be no. <laughs> and Hugh, while we're waiting up for some questions from uh, Chad, if anybody has any, sure. I didn't know if you knew, but we're having a LAN November 8th through the... 9th through 11th. the 11th. 11th. Or 9th, excuse me, 9th through the 11th in November. Yes. So did you have any plans? The 9th through <laughs> uh, the 11th? We ask everyone, just so, just so you know. Where, That's our thing. Where is it? It's in Chicago. It, it's in Chicago. <laughs> well, I might not personally be able to come because we would probably be in the sort of oh my god, we've just released this game and we really need to keep working on it really hard. But I'll tell you what, how, how big is the LAN? Uh, it's about 50 to 60 people usually. 50 to 60 people. I think absolutely, how about eight keys for your LAN? Oh, that'd be fantastic. Eight that keys. would be, yes, great. Sure, I mean, okay, everyone, done. I, I can't wait to try cool. it. <laughs> okay, yeah, we've got this recorded now. I can play it back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Except sure. I'll so sub those keys will get full access to the game, Very all our cool. tools, etc. I might I might sub I might put a little like sub in when you start talking to just say yeah and you guys will get twenty seven keys. Is that okay <laughs> if I do that? That's fine, right? Uh, you got any questions from from uh, from chat before we go, LB? Or are we are we all good? Uh, Demon in Flux wants to know the ETA on the Pink Marine skin. Mm, pink Marines. Pink Marine skin. Okay, that is one of our big priorities right now. Uh, the pink. <laughs> <laughs> uh, along with the pink skulk skin. Wow. And guys, we're pushing towards release, and we know that's a critical feature. So we think it will be there on release day. There will be this new skin, and you will be able to run around looking like a complete idiot. Oh, nice. Fantastic. Who well wants done. to play video games if they can't be pink? <laughs> we all know that's the first thing in our minds. <laughs> tra -la -la -la. <laughs> tra -la -la -la. Right, exactly. <laughs> well, uh, I just want to say thanks again, and... One of the Thank one of guys. the better interviews we've had with any team uh, for games. So I really appreciate you, appreciate you coming. I'm out. sure you're being kind, but that is very no, kind of you. And really it's, well. Thank you, and thank your viewers for taking an interest in Natural Selection Two. We we appreciate. I mean, you you hinted earlier we don't have a marketing budget. Right. We depend on the kindness of you guys to come and say, "Hey, your game looks alright. Want to tell <laughs> us about it?" So we really really appreciate it. Uh, we can't thank you enough for having us on your show. So if you want to, if people want to learn more about it, you know, before we go, obviously they can, they can reach out. Give them your, your Twitter first. Cause we always like to. Do okay. That. Twitter at NS2. So N you, S2. we're a very act. We love Twitter <laughs> and we love Facebook and we love Google plus. So we're all over that. And we love Reddit as well. We're posting very actively on Reddit. So uh, definitely uh, at NS2, you can visit natural section com Just kind of see a splash. We're actually changing that web server right now as we speak. Oh, cool. So but uh, yeah, there's a lot of places you can go and also facebook.com slash natural selection too. We put up a lot of content there, just what's happening with us right now. And Google Plus if you're if that's if that's your cup of tea as well. All right, fantastic. Uh, and LB, since we're rolling out, where can they hit you up? We'll give them, give them a little bit of a natural selection two knowledge. <laughs> well, you can hit me up on Twitter at LBSUTK. Hitman, where can they find you and your lovely Canadian self? <laughs> uh, you can follow me at Twitter at i6hitman and at my gaming Twitch channel at twitch.tv forward slash i6hitman. 
And as always, you can hit me up for the gaming knowledge that you've been seeking for your entire life at twitter.com slash dude I rock. That's D-O-O-D-I-R-O-C-K. Always remember, we release this full video on Fridays in the morning. So check out our uh, YouTube page. Subscribe there. And if you like the show, follow us here on Twitch. We are here every single Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. Central Time. Again, Hugh and everyone at Natural Selection, thanks so much for being on the show. Uh, maybe we can get you back here sometime thanks, when you. you guys release. Of course. When you're, when you're big and popular and famous, you can come back on. <laughs> we hope. <laughs> <laughs> we'll always talk to you no matter how big we get. Thanks so much. Right. Uh, and uh, with that, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks, everyone, for coming out, and thanks, everyone, for being in chat. Uh, we'll see you guys next week. Later. Later, everyone. See you guys.